We are here with Robert Schock. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself for those who don't know? Sure, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here, number one. And some people may know me from my work on the Great Sphinx in Egypt, but just to sort of start with a little bit of introduction, I am a geologist. I received my PhD in geology and geophysics at Yale University back in 1983. I hate to admit it was so long ago, so that really dates me. And I've been teaching at Boston University full time for the last 30 years since 1984. My research has spanned a number of areas from pure geology and stratigraphy and paleontology, that is fossils. I worked on fossil mammals for part of my dissertation at Yale. But what I'm most known for, I suppose, in the general public is my work of the last 25 years studying ancient civilizations. And in particular, I started with Egypt. I first became involved in uh, the study of the Great Sphinx back in 1989, 1990. And what I was brought in to do, and this was through my colleague and now good friend, John Anthony West, in the last 25 years, but he first met me in 1989, or thereabouts, introduced me to the problem of the age of the Egypt Great Sphinx. in 1990, specifically to look at the Great Sphinx from a geological point of view. The traditional Egyptologists consider the Great Sphinx, this, some people say the most tremendous monument, the most tremendous sculpture on Earth carved from the limestone bedrock on the Giza Plateau. They considered it to be 2500 BC, to date from 2500 BC approximately, and furthermore, that it was carved from scratch at that time. There were no predecessors, should we say, to the Great Sphinx. I went to look at it from a geological point of view to see if, in fact, this made sense. Um, looking at the bedrock geology, looking at the weathering, looking at the erosion, and to make a long story short, I very quickly found that the geological act, the weathering on the body of the Sphinx in particular, did not match the 2500 BC date. What I mean by that is that the body of the Sphinx is carved down into the bedrock, only the head stands above the general level of the plateau. And I'll say now, the head is recarved, so it's not the original head on the Great Sphinx. The body is what you have to look at, and the walls of what are known as the Sphinx enclosure, these are heavily weathered by rain, by precipitation, by rain falling down, running off the sides. You can see that in the way the layers have sort of what I call rolling or undulating profile. They have deep vertical fissures. And I want to say right now that sometimes people say, well, maybe it was rising Nile floods. No, it's not rising Nile floods. That would give a different geological signature. This is from rain beating down. The problem is for the Egyptological dating of 2500 BC that the Sahara has been the Sahara Desert hyper-arid for the last 5,000 years, from at least about 3,000 BC. So there was an incompatibility I noticed right away in what we see on the Sphinx, the body of the Sphinx, its layers of rock, which were weathered very definitively in a matter that in a manner that was not um, compatible with the last 5,000 years of climatic history in North Africa and the Sahara Desert in particular. So this suggested to me almost immediately on my first trip that there was something amiss here, that there was something earlier than the Great Sphinx as we see it now with a human head and a lion body, and that in fact the core body, what I call the core body of the Great Sphinx, goes back to an earlier period. And not just a few centuries, but based on the level of weathering, based on the climatic regime, had to go back at least a few thousand years. So that was the beginning. We did uh, seismic studies. I worked with geophysicist Thomas de Becky. We did uh, low energy seismic around the Sphinx and on the Giza Plateau. This too confirmed that the weathering around the base of the Sphinx was much deeper 
than would be expected for 2500 BC if it had been carved that geologically that recently. Uh, I looked at other aspects of the structure of not just the Sphinx, but was known as the Sphinx Temple. The Sphinx Temple sits just due east of the Sphinx and is built out of huge multi-ton, some of them tens of tons, limestone blocks that were in fact carved when the body of the Sphinx was carved. So they carved out these huge blocks, moved them just slightly due east to build the Sphinx Temple. Looked at that, looked at weathering of that, looked at repairs that were carried out in the 4th dynasty, circa 23 to 2500 BC. You find that there are repairs on the Sphinx, circa 23 to 24 or so hundred BC. Again, all of this data was incompatible with the Sphinx having initially been carved in 2500 BC. So the bottom line was, and I first presented this to the Geological Society of America, my fellow geologist, the bottom line was that the core body, the oldest portions of the Sphinx, go back to a much earlier period and I found that the head was recarved. It is a dynastic head, but if you look at the Sphinx, the head is too small for the body. It's out of proportion. What I believe was the case is that it was probably a male lion originally. That's my speculation. The head became highly eroded. They recarved it in dynastic times into a human head. The body, instead of trying to recarve it, if you look at the Sphinx now, it's covered with small limestone blocks in places. Some of these go back to Old Kingdom times, that is 23 to 25 or so hundred BC. They were repairing the very ancient weathering. They did the same with the temple in front of them. So what I really feel I opened up was a new chapter, if you would, an older chapter of activity, human activity on the Giza Plateau beginning with a, we'll call it a proto-sphinx, a structure that was there along with the temple that was associated with it. So I thought this was great. This would extend Egyptian history back before classical dynastic times. What I wasn't prepared for when I first started talking about this and presenting it at conferences in the early 1990s is that the Egyptologists in particular, they went they were livid. They were absolutely livid. The archaeologists were livid. They told me that this was absolutely impossible. They said that civilization didn't go back that far. Civilization only went back about five, maybe six thousand years at the most. People were hunter-gatherers. They couldn't <laughs> build stone sculptures. They couldn't build monumental structures. That I must be crazy. That I was a pseudoscientist. I mean, they, they were really calling me nasty names. They accused me of um, saying that uh, aliens from Mars or who knows what built the pyramids. And I wasn't even talking about the pyramids. I got to tell you, I've definitely uh, experienced some of that, um, you know, upset the working order and then get the backlash. Uh, we definitely know all about that. So just to give people a little bit of a background, um, would that, how would that jive with when they think the pyramids were actually built? I mean, w would that kind of suggest uh, in the old paradigm, the, the one that, you know, you're trying to upset or that you did upset, would that would suggest that the pyramids and the Sphinx were built uh, in roughly the same period? Yes, yes, exactly. In fact, much of their dating for the Sphinx was based on, and I understand this, I actually have a degree in anthropology at undergraduate level. I've studied archaeology formally. I've been on archaeological digs, that type of thing. And a lot of their argument is context, 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 sort of like real estate, you know, location, location, location. So their argument for the 2500 year date of BC, 2500 BC date of the Sphinx is that it is on the Giza Plateau, that it dates to the same period, period as the three pyramids, known as the Khufu Pyramid, the Khafra Pyramid, and the Menkara Pyramid, I'll use that term, you can also call it my Serenus. All the, all the pharaohs have um, different names. You know, Cheops versus Khufu, Khafra versus Shephra. So the Great Sphinx 
sits due east of the second pyramid, the Kafir or Shefram pyramid. He was a pharaoh that reigned about 2500 BC. They said, oh, given the context, it's due east of his pyramid. It must be part of his pyramid complex. Therefore, it must be 2500 BC. Furthermore, in what's known as the Valley Temple, which they assume was part of his complex, there was found in a pit back in the 19th century a beautiful statue of the pharaoh Shephron, or Kafir, you can call him either. This was found in the 19th century. It's now in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It says who it is. We know that this is um, Kafir from about 2500 BC. The Egyptologist said, aha, here's the base of Kafir. We now know what Kafir looks like. There's actually other statues of them too, and they all look the same. And they said, well, this is the face of Kafir. Look at the face of the Sphinx. It's the face of Kafir. So it must be that he built the Sphinx. Okay, two fallacies to that. Number one, I don't care whose face is on the Sphinx currently, even if it is the face or was the face of Kafir, it's a recarved head. So that doesn't affect my argument. Secondly, it turns out that when a forensic scientist who knows faces, looks at the face of the Sphinx and looks at the face of Kafir, they're not the same face. We actually had, as part of our research team, a fellow named Frank Domingo, Detective Frank Domingo from the New York Police Department at the time, forensic artist and scientist who is an expert at reconstructing faces, comparing faces. He looked very carefully at the face of Kafir, as known from the uh, statues of Kafir, including the famous one I just mentioned, and the face of the Sphinx, analyzed them carefully, came to the conclusion that was very good, competent artists carving both faces, that of the Sphinx and that of Kafir, but they're not the same individual, they're not even the same ethnic racial group, whatever you want to call it. That um, I don't know where the Egyptologists were thinking it was the same face um, from the Sphinx to uh, Kafir. It didn't look like it to me. It didn't look like the same face to me, but, you know, what am I? I'm a geologist. I don't, I'm not supposed to be able to recognize faces. <laughs> well, you know, and uh, he, so, he, so, I mean, they built up this elaborate, as I see it, and I'll be very blunt, elaborate facade on sort of secondary evidence that fit the paradigm they want fit with no real basis whatsoever. I'll mention one other piece of evidence they'll cite, and that is a stella between the paws of the Sphinx. It dates to New Kingdom times, so about 1400 or so BC. On it, supposedly, there was part of the name of Kafra when it was first found. That since flaked away, people said, um, some of the Egypt Paul just said, aha, this proves that Kafra built the Sphinx. Well, this was erected a thousand years after Kafra, and actually what it demonstrates, if anything, is that he subsequently dug the Sphinx out of the sand, because the Sphinx fills with sand very, very quickly. The Sphinx enclosure, it gets buried up to its neck in sand, since the Sahara Desert has been a hyper-arid desert, and it has to be dug out. It's recorded in dynastic times, and New Kingdom times, and late period times, that it was dug out numerous times by different pharaohs. And if there's anything to that Kafir inscription, which is now lost, uh, it probably was that he dug it out just as his um, descendants did, his you know later pharaohs did. So very, very circumstantial. And if you start looking at all the little evidence, the pieces that the Egyptologists use, in my opinion, they fall by the wayside. Well, that's fantastic. And, you know, given uh, what I will playfully say, uh, you know, of what little I know about uh, ancient Egypt, uh, given the egos of some of these pharaohs, the, the notion that they wouldn't put their own, um, you know, touch on certain things after the initial construction um, just, uh, I mean, it's, it seems like the exact kind of thing that a pharaoh would do. But, right. um, <laughs> I, I want to mention something else, actually. You just reminded me. There's a stella. Now, the Egyptologists dismiss it because, number one, it doesn't fit their paradigm. It doesn't fit what they want to say. And, two, it's a fairly uh, late period. But there's a stella, for instance, that talks about 
um, the Pharaoh Khufu, who was before Khafra, repairing the Sphinx after it was hit by lightning, which you know says very clearly it was an ancient, you know, in existence and ancient at the time of uh, Khufu or Cheops, who is a predecessor of Khafra. But they just dismiss that because it doesn't fit what they, yeah. You know, the story they want to tell. Well, plus uh, the idea that it would get hit by lightning during its super arid period uh, wouldn't really jive with them as well. Exactly. Um, I mean, that's interesting. Something I wanted to go back to, um, you know, you talked about how the other Egyptologists um, were upset because they said, oh, you know, humans weren't building at that time. They were just hunter-gatherers. Uh, I will assume that at that time, and I, I don't uh, what around what time was that uh, year wise? Okay, I did not say that purposefully. Okay, <laughs> because that's part of the story. When I first started working on the Sphinx in the early 1990s, I admit now, in hindsight, and this was I don't want to say a mistake, but my bias at the time. I'm a geologist. I was looking at the evidence, climatic evidence level and degree of weathering, uh, level of subsurface uh, mineralogical changes that we picked up seismically, and I was doing my best, I admit in hindsight, and this was not necessarily as conscious as I realize, as I think of it now, but I was sort of making it as recent as possible and still being compatible with the geological evidence, and at that time, in the early 1990s, I was suggesting that maybe the Sphinx was originally carved five to 7,000 B.C. or so, uh, which, you know, was really upsetting to the Egyptologists and the archaeologists, to the um, historians, to the prehistorians, five to 7,000 B.C., because they said that was when people were hunter-gatherers. Fast right. forward up to now, 20-plus years later, now I think realistically looking at the evidence and also looking at um, other things that have developed since, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, I believe, I'm now happy pushing the origins of the Sphinx back to even 10,000 or so BC, the very end of the last ice age, which might sound uh, incredible, but I believe we have good reason to do that. First, the geological evidence uh, that I have, and, and as I interpret it, I think is actually more compatible with that point of view. Even in the 1990s, when I was presenting this to my purely geological colleagues, and again, I'm a geologist and geophysicist. I don't claim to be an archaeologist or an Egyptologist, although I've worked in these fields for a very long time. But from a purely geological point of view, my own colleagues back in the early 1990s said, you know, you shock, they referred to me as shock, um, you're really sort of straining the, the geological evidence to push it back to the five to 7,000 BC versus even further back. Uh, and I don't know, I think I had the bias, why well, I didn't want to upset the Egyptologists too much, it didn't really matter. As long as I was beyond 3,000 BC, they were going to be upset anyway. Well, so yeah. again, I think that consciously, but I just want to clarify, in my older works and writings, I talked about five to 7,000 B.C. I'm really talking several thousand years earlier now. I talk about this in my book, Forgotten Civilization, uh, and this ties in also with what I believe was happening at the end of the last ice age, which included torrential rains, a uh, very different climate than we have now, and I believe that the evidence we have is indicating that we had civilization, what I call high civilization, back at the end of the last ice age, all of which was devastated by major solar outbursts, but I'm sure we'll get to that. Well, absolutely, and you know, clearly back in the uh, early 90s, they weren't as well versed on things like uh, Gobekli Tempe and... Uh, well, that was the next thing I wanted to mention. Yeah, go, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, if we sort of continue the story here, go, okay, so we're back in the early 1990s, 1991 specifically, I present this material at the Geological Society of America annual meeting. I present my data for redating the Great Sphinx. This caused, at the time, 
a huge sensation. It even had headlines in uh, New York Times, Los Angeles uh, Post, that type of thing. So it really was a big deal. My geological colleagues looked at the data. They thought it was uh, very interesting. They thought it was pertinent, apropos, basically, not basically, they agreed with it. I had one good close friend just before I presented, I showed him the data and whatnot, and he started laughing at me. And I thought he had made, he, I thought he was laughing at me in the sense that I had made a mistake. And here I was about to present something so radical. No, he said he was laughing because it frankly was not very complex geology. It was a fairly simple, straightforward analysis. And it was so simple, he wondered where the Egyptologists had been all these years. I mean, had they never looked at the geology? So my geological colleagues really accepted this. But my, I'll say, other academic colleagues, like the Egyptologists, the historians, they were livid, as I said. So late 1991, I presented to the geologists. There's a scramble among the Egyptologists and historians to put me in my place, they arranged in early 1992 a special subsection of the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting. They arranged what they called the Sphinx debate uh, within just a few months of my presentation. And I was invited along with Thomas DeBecky, the geophysicist, and on the other side was Mark Lehner and one of his colleagues, Mark Lehner, was a, a very prominent Egyptologist at the time, and we were going to debate the age of the Sphinx. So this is early 1992, rather unprecedented. What I found very quickly was that it wasn't so much a debate, it was supposed to put me in my place and to squelch me, to quiet me. They weren't really interested in looking at data. I essentially was called names, including a pseudoscientist, you know, someone that was just a publicity hound. And Mark Lehner, the Egyptologist, he thought he had the definitive comment when he said to the effect that people were hunters and gatherers back then they did not build monumental architecture and sculptures. Show him a place anywhere else on earth where at this remote period in time they were doing massive stonework. They were building, you know, monumental structures. And my answer at the time, this is 1992, is I didn't have an example. But as a geologist, I realized, you know, you have to first discover it and recognize the first dinosaur. You have to start somewhere. They didn't like that answer. So I didn't have a good answer, but I felt comfortable with my data. Fast forward now, three years later, 1995, Klaus Schmidt, who unfortunately just passed away, uh, but Herr Professor Dr. Klaus Schmidt of the German Archaeological Institute is in Turkey, southeastern Turkey, he starts excavating the site of Gebekli Tepe. So this begins to be excavated three years after the challenge to me to show them another site that has incredible sophistication, monumental stonework, and dates from this early period. So three years later, the site begins to be uncovered, known as Gebekli Tepe, really does not make the news, either archaeological news or public news, well into the early 21st century. Now we have Gebekli Tepe, though. Uh, Klaus Schmidt, before he passed away last month, had excavated four well known stone circles or stone enclosures. These are incredible, monumental stonework, and the thing is, it dates to the period. 9,000 to 10,000 BC. The oldest portions actually go back into the very end of the last ice age. So here we have a second side confirmation of what I have been saying for the last 25 years now. And the answer to that question that was posed to me. So for me, Gebekli Tepe is an incredibly important site. My wife and I have visited the site a number of times. I had the chance to um, speak with uh, Klaus Schmidt 
before he passed away recently about this site. I was very, honestly, I personally was very skeptical about the dating of this site until I had a chance has to read all the technical reports, to look at it on site, to look at the stratigraphy, to look at the geology. And I guarantee it, it the dating is good. It's absolutely, um, you know, more than I could have asked for back in 1992 to answer the question. It consists of stone circles. People, everyone knows Stonehenge. Gebekli Tepe is sort of comparable to Stonehenge. But not exactly. Stonehenge is one stone circle. Quebecli Tepe has 20 some stone circles, most of which have yet to be excavated. Four of them have been more or less fully excavated. So when you go to the site, you can see four major stone enclosures or stone circles. These are very Stonehenge like in the sense that they consist of upright monumental stones arranged more or less in circles. They have uh, each has a pair of center stones, but they're on Stonehenge-like in the sense that if you think of Stonehenge, Stonehenge is created or was built out of very crude, rough-hewn stones. Some of them are, look almost natural. They're not smoothly polished. They're not beautifully carved. At Gebekli Tepe, which is much older than the traditional dating of Stonehenge. In fact, if you think about Stonehenge, the traditional dating, you know, borders on 3000 BC. So let's say roughly 5,000 years ago, Gebekli Tepe is more than twice as old as that, 9 to 10,000 BC or 11 to 12,000 years old. So Stonehenge people, if you take the traditional date for Stonehenge, are closer to us than they were to the Gebekli Tepe people in time. Yet Gebekli Tepe, the pillars there are beautifully carved. They're smooth, they're straight, they're uh, uh, very thin relative to their height. Some of them are about five, five and a half meters tall for the tallest ones. They have reliefs of animals carved onto them. Some of them are anthropomorphic or humanoid with arms and hands and uh, beautiful belts and loincloths. Uh, the hands are, um, actually, if you think of the Easter Island Moai, the way the arms and hands are arranged close to the navel, that's what you have at Quebecri Tepe also. You have uh, carvings in the round. There's what's known as a totem pole. It's this uh, carved, again, stone monumental structure. It's now in the museum in Urfa. It was put there for safekeeping. So it's just an absolutely incredible site, incredible sophistication. If you found some of these structures isolated, just one of these monuments or one of these carvings, you might say it's Oh, it looks like it's 1,000 B.C. or so, not 9, 10,000 B.C. So it shows, I believe, absolutely confirms that we have sophisticated, advanced civilization at this level back over 10,000 years ago. Something else that's interesting about Quebecli Tepe, and I am absolutely convinced this is the case analyzing geologically, the entire site was finally covered over artificially, purposefully, by 8000 BC. So everything there of the main site, everything in the main site was sealed up, covered over artificially 10,000 years ago, 8000 BC. Uh, and parts of it go back several thousand years earlier than that. So, yeah, you know, I'm just to this day, ecstatic about Gebekli Tepe and how it ties in with the bigger picture and I believe cooperates and confirms my initial analysis based in Egypt on the Great Sphinx that we have civilization going back much earlier, what I call an uh, earlier cycle of civilization. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, of particular interest to, to those most likely to be listening to this, you mentioned a catastrophic solar event. What uh, what sort of event do you think took place, and uh, what gives you the clues uh, to come to that conclusion? Well, 
Yeah, here we have to sort of outline things a little bit. Or just to give you the, the bigger picture, something that has uh, been very, very, how do I want to say, interesting. It's been a problem. Something I've dealt with or I've been interested in, certainly since I was a graduate student long before, well, when I say long before, you know, 10 years before I got involved in Egypt and the Great Sphinx. I've been involved with them so long for now. Now, you know, when I speak now, but that is the problem of the end of the last ice age. What was going on at the end of the last ice age? And when you look at the end of the last ice age, there are a couple of things that I just want to point out very briefly. The final segment, if you would, the final temporal period at the end of the last ice age is known as the Younger Dryas. So everyone thinks of the Ice Age, it was very cold, etc., etc. It was actually starting to warm up, but at 10,900 B.C. approximately, all of a sudden there is a cold snap. There's a cold spell, and it suddenly gets very cold again. Some people call this sort of a mini Ice Age at the end of the last Ice Age. So it gets very cold about 10,900 B.C., then approximately 1,200 years later, and I'm using the most recent dating for this geologically. Other people will say 9600 B.C. or 9500 B.C., but the best dating I'm convinced is about 9700 B.C. At that point, it suddenly gets incredibly warm, very, very warm, and based on ice cores in particular from Greenland, also looking at various sediment cores and uh, other data, including even some lunar data that was collected. We have a very sudden warming snap just about 9700 BC at the best calibration. And this happened so quickly that based on ice cores, it was within one to three years. The thing is, we can't resolve it any better than that. It could have literally been within a couple of weeks or even overnight. So incredible warming at 9700 BC, going back a little bit, 1200 years, cooling at 10,900 BC. The cooling event is sudden geologically, but not as sudden as the warming at night. 9700 BC. So what explains these two things? Uh, my, I believe the evidence right now, and my hypothesis should we say, but I believe backed up by evidence, is that there's lots of data indicating there was probably a comet or some kind of physical extraterrestrial impactor that either hit Earth or exploded in the atmosphere, many people pinpoint over um, Canada, over northern Canada, but some kind of impact or some kind of, well, let's just call it a comet, that impacted Earth caused the cooling spell at 10,900 BC. There's evidence for this in the sense of iridium spikes, uh, microspherules, uh, nano diamonds, that type of thing. 10,900 BC would put dust and debris and whatnot into the atmosphere. You would expect a cooling effect. We know that Earth is hit uh, by comets and meteors and that type of thing on a regular basis. Geologically, I'm talking regular basis. Uh, it's been very well established now. This is what caused uh, some of the major Cretaceous extinctions and the extinction of the dinosaurs, a much larger one, 65 million years ago. So I think the evidence is that some kind of cometary impact 10,900 BC set off the Younger Dryas cooling spell. But then how do you explain the evidence for the incredible warming, which is essentially off the scale, if you would, in 9700 BC. And when you look at isotope data uh, for solar activity and uh, various proxies for solar activity that you find, again, sediment cores and um, ice cores, I believe what we had at 9700 BC is an incredible solar outburst. You know, coronal mass ejections, as you follow in modern times, you know, for the sun right now, uh, uh, essentially a, a huge solar outburst, the Carrington event, 
by orders of magnitude greater. In uh, about 9700 BC, followed by probably smaller ones after that, and I think that the evidence in this base mostly a lot of this is based on isotope evidence from Greenland ice cores, shows that the sun was very active, very unstable at that time, underwent these major solar outbursts, and this would have the effect of uh, warming the climate dramatically, virtually overnight, virtually instantaneously. Uh, this is something that was uh, predicted by uh, Thomas Gold or hypothesized by Thomas Gold as early as the 1960s. While he was an award-winning astronomer at Cornell University, but people say, oh, you've gone off the deep end when you're talking about something like that happening. But he, as other astrophysicists have pointed out, our star, our sun, is a star. It's not the same all the time uh, geologically. I can put it that way. I mean, it goes through periods of variability. It goes through periods of relative instability versus more stable periods. And it was, at, I believe, a very unstable period. Well, that would make sense. 13,000, uh, 10,000 BC, 12,000 years ago. Well, you know, and uh, in terms of the potential for that to have an effect on Earth, we're even finding out just now, uh, even just looking back over the past hundred or two hundred years that you know in addition to the Sun having a lot of variability Earth's protection from the Sun has a lot of variability I mean just in the last um, 150 200 years we we've lost anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the strength of the magnetic shield and this is the latest of which is coming from ESA's swarm mission and so um, you know God forbid that uh, during that time, there was, uh, you know, a major weakening of the magnetosphere, just like uh, we're kind of on our way to seeing now. Uh, this could have even amplified the effect even more and even makes it, you know, uh, it's just one more thing you can add to the, oh, well, yeah, this could be possible if these things were happening. So uh, I'm right with you, and I'm pretty sure that those who have been, you know, following our channel... Uh, you know, their heads are kind of spinning right now with all these ideas and uh, are very much on point with what you're saying. So exactly. And I wanted to mention some to give credit where credit's due in part. Um, but I wanted to mention, too, that there's other evidence for this. When you start looking at the archaeological record, I believe that a lot of things fall into place when you start thinking in terms of a major solar outburst bringing down these early civilizations, these um, what I'll call late Ice Age civilizations. I do want to mention, I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with Anthony Perrot mm -hmm. and his work, Dr. Perrot and his, uh, the plasma physicist. Um, I don't know if he's still there, but Los, Al Los Alamos um, National Laboratory. And he has done, of course, a lot of work looking at petroglyphs in particular, ancient petroglyphs, and has independently, independent from my work, hypothesized or suggested that these ancient petroglyphs are drawings, effectively, of plasma configurations in the sky during a major solar outburst in antiquity, as he calls it, uh, deep antiquity. I believe this corresponds with the... Um, solar outburst I'm talking about at the end of the last ice age. So the people at that time were actually recording things in the sky. When we look at things like the Carrington event and the description of the Carrington event in 1859, people talk about seeing dancing figures, sort of like stick figure type um, images in the sky. You find this in ancient texts, including the Bible, descriptions of these things. I talk about this in Forgotten Civilization, my book. So I think you have uh, uh, in mythology and archaeology something that um, Katie, my wife, and I have uh, done is we've spent some time on Easter Island. Easter Island has what's known as the Rongo Rongo script, which consists of We'll call them hieroglyphics. That's what people call it. It's eluded any kind of real cogent linguistic analysis or uh, decipherment. And we believe, and I can't develop this all right now, but we believe that it too is based on a major solar outburst. 
plasma configurations that you would see in the sky during this, in this uh, recollection, this memory. Uh, I'll mention a few other things. For instance, it has been noted by archaeologists that many ancient sites, again going back specifically to the um, late Ice Age and just after, are associated with caves, with underground uh, shelters, should we say. Some of them natural, some of them artificial or natural, uh, and then artificially expanded and elaborated. And they wondered, why would ancient people spend all this time doing this? But to me, it makes a lot of sense if there were major solar outbursts and they needed them, or if they had collective memory of these, that they might occur again. And this would be a way to escape them. Also, why build with um, you know huge stone structures, or why is that the primary thing that survives? Well, it would survive um, this, this type of... Um, you know, catastrophe. Yeah. yeah. So Makes I think sense. this is all very real. Um, can um, My wife is here. Can she say something? Absolutely. I just wanted to say I'm actually standing on the other side of the recorder, but the front of your bus, your mobile observatory, has the, uh, the squatting has man. The forest, the, the little stick figure. Yeah. With the two dots on the side. Yeah, we call Those that the squatting man logo. Well, that's really what we're talking about. All of P P Dr. Parat at Los Alamos has identified in 130 countries all over the world all these petroglyphs that have a similar shape to what we're talking about, your squatter man, as people call them, but similar to that, perhaps stacks of arms and legs and cascading cylindrical shapes and stick figure men with birds heads yes. and so that was the first piece of the puzzle for us that we were watching David Talbot's Symbols of an Alien Sky and we saw that and we had just gotten back from Easter Island and Robert is just absolutely intensively studying the Rongo Rongo and that one night we just made the connection oh my god where the where the petroglyphs are isolated images one one etching, another etching. The Rongo Rongo, we believe, might be a text because the shapes all correlate to what Dr. Parat is saying is, in essence, a record of a massive solar outburst. And so that was really what sent Robert's eyes <laughs> looking upward and, and then sent him pouring into the research of exactly what happened at the end of the last Ice Age. So that was really the key. It was David Talbot's um, documentary and Dr. Parat's work and our trip to Easter Island and making that making that connection. Yeah. So. And I, I wanted to say, again, you know, I'm a geologist and geophysicist, so I wouldn't be going out on a limb for this if there wasn't physical evidence. You know, if it was only myths and it was only petroglyphs, I wouldn't be quite so impressed. But when you have that type of evidence tied in with the um, hard physical evidence, for instance, the isotope analyses from, uh, you know, the ice cores that... Uh, go back to the end of the last ice age in Greenland, when you have uh, uh, solidified objects, little spirals and whatnot that are being found at um, ancient sites now, you know, archaeological sites going back to the end of the last ice age, which could, uh, or I believe, do indicate a major solar outburst. Vitrification is something else I should mention. Vitrification is something that has been found in the archaeological record, which is very mysterious in the sense of um, how do you explain it. What it is, is surface melting and recongealing, I'll call it that way, refreezing of rock surfaces at archaeological sites. This is known um, throughout parts of Europe and getting into Turkey and Syria. And many of them are dated, I believe, back to the end of the last ice age. And how do you explain this? This gets back to something that Thomas Gould was talking about and hypothesized in the 60s that during a major, major solar outburst, you would have in certain areas, sort of like a tornado, not everywhere, but certain areas, huge, we could think of as huge thunderbolts or lightning bolts actually hitting the surface, uh, causing you know, 
incredible temperatures on the surface. He suggested that as evidence for what he was hypothesizing, one could look in the geological record, record for vitrification, and um, I believe we found it. You also find that in parts of the Sahara, for instance. Well, the whole region, or the, whole the drying region. I mean, of I, the region. I do, I do think that, um, you know, looking at it in this light and looking at the evidence, it's um, putting a lot of things in place. I want to mention one other thing. When I was a kid, when I say a kid, going back to high school, I, uh, I hate to admit this, I actually skipped classes sometimes to go to the library. And among other things, I would read Plato. That was just the way I was. Now, most people probably are familiar with one thing from Plato, if they know anything about Plato, and that is the story of Atlantis. I don't take Atlantis incredibly literally. I'm not one of those people that is going to, that's seeking the geographic region of Atlantis. But what I find very interesting is when you look at Plato's recounting of Atlantis, which he says ultimately the story came from Egypt, he is very clear about um, the chronology. And when you turn that into our modern chronology, he basically dates the fall of Atlantis, which was catastrophic due to uh, natural events, which I think could be interpreted as uh, solar outbursts and the ramifications from a solar outburst. He dates it to about 9600 BC, which to me is more, it's probably beyond coincidental that this in fact is the modern dating of the end of the last ice age. So just lots of little pieces of evidence that I think fit into a cogent pattern here. Well, I would, t I would definitely agree, and uh, especially given some of the things that we've been looking into recently, uh, I'll mention two things. You know, uh, in terms of having some kind of solar outburst cause uh, basically the cosmic thunderbolt, or the thunderbolt of the gods, as they say, um, isn't completely out of the realm of possibility. Uh, for those who have been listening to our interactions with Dr. Kong Pop Uyen, uh, he's a big, uh, largely in favor of uh, electrostatic, um, uh, electrostatic, um, you know, forces having a role in some of these events as opposed to purely electromagnetic. Um, and so, if you get enough. Uh, plasma and charged particles from the sun interacting with our magnetosphere, ionosphere, atmosphere. There's a lot of static electricity, uh, you know, in addition to just the, the charge exchange between the particles. And, um, you know, that would all, you know, the, the work on lithosphere, atmosphere, ionosphere coupling uh, is actually quite extensive at this point. Um, and something else, we were, uh, you know, we see that terrestrial gamma flashes, or what they call that that dark lightning, or, or the things that are produced when we have sprites, those fire up the magnetic field lines of Earth, uh, yeah. a, a, at least according to NASA. Uh, they have had they have some great uh, visuals on that and animations, and so if it's, uh, you know, the other way around, it wouldn't, you know, maybe that energy would get funneled down the magnetic field lines and cause the same type of... Uh, bolt in the opposite direction. So this is this is really along the lines of some of the things that, you know, our, our community's been thinking about, and I'm really happy that you brought this up. Um, we have a section on our website called Electric Earth and Sun, and uh, it deals with the earth spots hypothesis, earth spots being like sun spots, and uh, having these kind of connections. And boy, I, it's really refreshing to hear you say that, um, you know, these places of, of vitrification uh, could very well be linked uh, both in time and theoretically through you know science to these solar outbursts because I think that that's what we've been driving at for a while yeah no I, I think it's all fitting together very well and you know finally I feel like you know this this is this is what I like personally you know comprehensive um, Story that uh, makes a story sense. that makes sense, a theory that makes sense, and I think that's what we're finding versus, uh, you know, trying to explain. I mean, I'll give you an example of vitrification, just because it's something I've been looking at. Classical archaeologists, they tried to explain vitrification by, you know, they were building campfires or they were um, trying to burn down forts. 
we you don't get the temperatures. You wouldn't get the. Um, you, you, it's been demonstrated experimentally. You can't do it. Yeah, I would get agree. The temperatures that way that would be needed, um, and you don't get the uh, surface properties. You know. Well, in addition to your decades of fantastic work, uh, you certainly haven't rested on your laurels, especially with uh, some of your newer research and some of the works. Uh, that you've been putting together. You want to talk about those uh, for a bit? Sure. Uh, yeah, the research never uh, ends, at least that's the way I see it. My latest book, if people want to catch up on um, what I've been doing in the last 25 years, I really recommend my latest book, which is Forgotten Civilization. That's the title, Forgotten Civilization, singular, Forgotten Civilization. And the subtitle is The Role of Solar Outbursts in Our Past and Future. So Forgotten Civilization, The Role of Solar Outbursts in Our Past and Future. And if you don't mind, can I put, put a plug for my website? Definitely. Okay, so if you want to find out more about um, me and what I've been doing, have uh, uh, yeah, there's a link to my book from my website. My personal website is www.robertshock.com. And my last name is spelled S-C-H-O-C-H. So it's R-O-B-E-R-T-S-C-H-O-C-H, all run together, dot com. So www.robertshock.com. We travel. People will um, take a look at my latest book. Also, I uh, travel, of course, for my research, that type of thing. I uh, speak at conferences, and I also take people on trips to various sites, including Egypt, including Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. I'll be doing a trip to India in about a year or so. So that information is also on my website, www.robertshock.com. So I, I am a firm believer that it's nice to read about things and to, what do they call it, surf the internet but you really can't understand some of these ancient sites. You really can't understand the science unless you experience it for yourself. It's and um, that's what I do. Actually, as a rule of thumb, I don't try. I don't express strong opinions on anything unless I've actually seen it, unless I've studied it myself. So um, I'm always looking for. Um, well, there's always more to study. I, I was going to give you an example quickly. Uh, Katie and I, my wife, had a chance to go to Indonesia uh, end of last year to see an exciting new site known as Gunung Padang. And I was skeptical about it, as I always am, because sometimes I get invited to see, quote, ancient sites that turn out not to be ancient sites at all. They're just natural formations, or in some cases, they're frankly fraudulent. But here in Indonesia, we have a site that I believe, there's no question, it's artificial, it's human constructed, and so the carbon radio dates that go with it, the borehole analysis, etc., indicates that it goes back to the end of the last ice age, and this is all very preliminary, but it's quite sophisticated too, in a different way but uh, quite sophisticated, sort of uh, step pyramid-like structure made from the local andesitic rocks. But I think it once again indicates that we had civilization, what I call true civilization, at the end of the last ice age that was de devastated by these solar outbursts. So part of my research as it continues is um, to look at these uh, subjects to look at these uh, topics and I'm a geologist and I know something that you've been talking about on uh, your various reports and website are the correlations between solar activity and for instance climatic patterns of earthquake activity and this is something that I think we need to take very seriously and not dismiss I know that many of my academic colleagues traditionally have said, well, solar variability is too small, is too trivial to have any real effect on Earth phenomena. And I think that is an absolute mistake. 
I think what we're finding is that there are many uh, ramifications throughout the solar system that we are all tied together. Actually, someone that I studied with, he's now deceased, but a very good geologist was um, Australian uh, by the name of uh, Rhodes Fairbridge, and he stressed this even though it was, um, he was criticized for it at the time, but that our solar system, including the Earth system, is all, is all interconnected, is all linked. <clears throat> so this is one direction that my research is going in. Another thing I want to mention, and I talk about this in Forgotten Civilization, is I believe, as we discussed, there's this very strong evidence I'm convinced of it, that there was a major solar outburst at the end of the last ice age. I also think that the evidence indicates, and I don't mean to be scary or a fear monger, but indicates that our sun is again going to a period of instability similar to what we saw 12,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. That we're going to a period of instability that we may be due, I hate to say it, for um, some yeah. major surprises on the part of the sun, so maybe some major solar outburst. The Carrington event of 1859, I believe, may have just been the start of uh, things to come. You right? know, that, um, that is a, a really uh, good point you make, and in terms of instability, uh, that goes both ways in terms of, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, just looking back at the records we do have, that uh, just because the sun is not, you know, highly active for months and years upon end doesn't mean you can't have that sudden outburst. The Carrington event itself was during a fairly weak solar cycle by comparison. And if you, if you look at just the last um, solar uh, sunspot minimum, uh, the one that uh, is being talked about as you know the the longest and the lowest solar minimum of the space age and probably uh, that we have on record since uh, the Maunder minimum even during that time of extreme quiet which included the year without sunspots we had an X-17 and an X-14 and um, you know during this solar maximum we haven't had anything above I believe uh, an X-6 or an X-7 so um, it's interesting that during these times when the sun is supposedly not as active, we can have these massive outbursts. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it kind of seems that, you know, the stable periods would be that clear. You get the flares at solar maximum, then you wane at solar minimum. Um, but during these times of instability, there may be that period where the sun's not wholly active and then out of nowhere, boom, goes the solar flare. Um, exactly. It's, um, based on, uh, for instance, isotope analysis, I, I think that's what we had back at the end of the last ice age. So I'm very, um, you know, again, I don't want to be a fear monger. I'm not trying to predict bad things, but I think we have to look at the data. We have to look at it realistically. And I do think we have to be prepared. When I say we, we as a civilization, we as a society, prepared for... Um, some major surprises, should we say, and maybe it shouldn't be a surprise, um, but some major activity on the part of the sun. Absolutely. Which come out of nowhere. And I'm afraid that, um, I don't mean to be preachy here, but I'm afraid that our society is woefully unprepared for such things. Uh, and we're incredibly vulnerable uh, with our modern electronics and our dependence on electricity and electricity and um, you know electrical grid systems. I mean, it's well understood by those people who have studied it that if we had a Carrington event today, it would be devastating. Yeah. And, and I, I think we could well have something much stronger than a Carrington event. Certainly not out of the realm of possibilities. And, uh, what what do you think? I mean, you've been studying this. Yeah, well, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that the sun uh, is heading towards um, a somewhat calmer period. But it would also sort of make sense that the sun would need to get this, to get these outbursts of energy, uh, even during a period when it's otherwise calm. You know, we've seen evidence, uh, or we've seen examples where uh, certain 
uh, periods of what they call, you know, the all quiet events on the sun are interrupted by a sun diving comet or by uh, a certain planetary conjunction or something like that. So um, one would have to assume that during these times when the sun is not extraordinarily active for uh, extended periods that, you know, it, it's, it's still waiting to... Um, it's still waiting to get that energy out and um, you know if that happens you know and it's been inactive uh, one might guess that it you know has been building up and building up and waiting to release that that might be a time when um, the outbursts intermittent though they may be uh, could be of you know the more severe nature that's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm a geologist, so sometimes, you know, when I speak to students or whatnot, or the general public, I use uh, analogy of um, earthquakes. You know, building up. You, we know that there's earthquake zones. We know there where there are certain fault lines, and if you build up a lot of pressure along one of those, you might think for years or decades or centuries, oh, everything's fine and great. Oh, no earthquakes recently, but the pressure is building up, and um, then you have a big one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, absolutely. just as an analogy. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm concerned that uh, just like you're saying that it's it's building up. Well, I would and definitely you, agree you, that you, um, you may be um, uh, brought into a, a false sense of security. Yeah, a little bit of the normalcy bias. Well, I got to tell you, thank you so much for coming on, both to you and your wife. Um, there's a lot more to check out on your website, actually, than uh, just your newest stuff. Um, you could probably get lost on there for a couple of days just checking stuff out. Um, and I also would like to mention that uh, your your website name uh, is proudly, uh, at least on my part, uh, on the Mobile Observatory. Uh, you guys uh, were kind enough to help sponsor the tour. Really appreciate that. And um, just thank you so much for coming on. I know that everyone really appreciates uh, you taking the time to do that. Uh, you're doing great work. So um, uh, keep it up, and let's let's um, you know keep in touch, stay in touch. I mean, I think there's a lot to be done here, and uh, you know, there's a real. I feel among all of us working in these fields, there's a real synergy and. Yeah, you know, a lot that we need to accomplish for the Earth. Absolutely, and at some point, the uh, the the focus and the analysis has to switch from, um, you know, I guess I would call uh, extreme focus on our individual strengths and more of an interdisciplinary uh, coalescence of all of the clues of all of the factors. So, yes, uh, exactly. And I know that you and I and many of the people in this field, we have felt that. I um, mean, part of my story is you know coming. Uh, at things as a geologist and the prehistorians, the Egyptologists, you know, they're not used to uh, interdisciplinarity, if I could use that term. They're not used to uh, working with uh, people from other fields. Yeah. Now, believe me, I, I feel you there. Well, I'm very much looking forward to um, talking with you again. Uh, we had spoken about me, me trying to get out to, uh, to Boston maybe at some point next year. Definitely yeah. going to look forward to that. And, uh, just thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Robert Schock, everyone, uh, professor at Boston University.